I'm going to begin with a word of prayer, and then Pastor Bobby is going to come and lead us in some congregational singing this evening. It's great to see everybody tonight. Let's go ahead and pray. Lord, we're so thankful for just the morning this morning. Uh, it, was, it was a joy to be in your house and to worship together and praise your name. And we come with um, hearts that are ready to praise your name. Uh, we come ready to hear, to hear from your word tonight. And so, Lord, I pray that you would just um, bless this time. We want to sanctify it and give it to you for your glory and just do a work among your people. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Pastor Bobby. Amen. We're going to sing a song that we've learned over the last couple of months. We will feast in the house of Zion, uh, taken from one of the psalms. It's a wonderful, wonderful truth for us to think about the words as we sing it. sing this next song. It's entitled Mighty to Save. speaks of the power of God for salvation. And if you're saved in here, this should be an easy one for you to sing out. Everyone needs compassion. 
love that's never failing, let mercy fall on me. Everyone needs forgiveness, the kindness of a Savior, the hope of nations. song that we're going to end with is great is thy faithfulness Um, we can be assured and i think pastor referred to it this morning in lamentations is the lord's mercies that we are not consumed and jeremiah goes on to say great is thy faithfulness Thank you. 
sacrifice of your son that each and every day as pastor preached about this morning we can have the comfort that you provide to the good gifts that you give i pray that uh, for anybody in here who is struggling or doubting that they would be reminded once again of your faithfulness to us lord they be encouraged and strengthened in your name amen thank you for singing you can be seated all right good evening church Welcome in. I'm glad we're here tonight. Glad we could worship the Lord together. It's been a great singing and worshiping together through song. I'm just so glad that we could meet together and study God's word together this evening. You could turn into your Bibles to the book of Exodus. We're going to go back into the books, book of Exodus uh, tonight. Exodus chapter 17. Exodus 17. Just want to say thank you to you, church, for your love. Uh, for your love to us, um, my family and I, I just want to publicly uh, thank uh, many of you who um, just uh, showered us with uh, gifts at Christmas time, and it was just a blessing to to be able to be encouraged by you and many of you with uh, wonderful words and cards. And man, I got so many cookies, I didn't I didn't know what to do. I I mean, I I loved them though. I I'm not complaining at all. But I, we got so many cookies. I was I, I probably gained a little a little weight uh, this this last holiday season. But uh, it was a blessing, and um, I'm just so thankful for you all. And I felt so loved by you. So I just wanted to publicly say thank you to you, church, for your for your generosity um, and just thinking about us during the holidays. Um, well, we're getting back into um, Exodus. As we start this new year, we've been um, away from it a little bit. And so I just want to kind of review uh, where we've been recently as we uh, jump into the last part of chapter 17. Um, you remember that Israel has been delivered from bondage and uh, from Egypt there in slavery. And now they're on their way, they're on their journey to the promised land. And we've seen in the last 
few passages of Scripture. We've studied uh, lessons uh, in the journey. Um, we've we talked about um, how God is trying to teach them that they aren't to whine. No whining. Trust your leaders. God will guide you. God will protect you. God will provide for you. God will always be with you. These are just some of the lessons that we have learned so far in just a few short passages of Scripture as they have left bondage and they have freedom because of God and are now on their journey uh, home to the promised land. And these are some very basic uh, spiritual lessons that God's people learned during uh, their long journey through the wilderness. And they honestly had to constantly be reminded of these lessons that they learned. It's, it's too bad that they couldn't go through these first few times of trials, uh, of, of hardship, and just learn the lesson right away, but they had to go through the, uh, reminders of it many, many times. And it's just like uh, our Christian lives, that we know these things, we read these things, and yet we have to be constantly reminded of these things. And that's one reason we get to sing these beautiful songs that speak of Great is thy faithfulness, that God is always faithful, and that one day we're going to get to our home in heaven, that this world isn't our home, but we are just passing through this world, and our home is waiting for us in heaven, in that wonderful promised land, and we need to be reminded of these things, that God will always be with us, that he will guide us, that he will provide for us, that he will protect us, that we shouldn't whine and fret and complain, that we should trust those that God has put uh, uh, in our lives to help us along the way. And we see here, as we move into the last portion of chapter 17, this next lesson that they are going to learn, this lesson that we see here, that they are to depend upon God by looking to Him. You see, the first few times we see the people after the Red Sea, we find that their biggest enemy, listen, their biggest enemy was themselves, right? If you studied out those things and you remind yourself of the things that they went through, you will begin to see that their biggest enemy was themselves. Their whining, their complaining, their lack of faith in God's provision all came from within themselves. They begin to look at the outward circumstances around them and they begin to fear and they begin to fret and their biggest enemy was themselves. But now in this passage, we find a new enemy. When Israel was delivered from bondage in Egypt, the first enemies they faced were not external, but internal. Their struggle was the war within, the, the battle that is waged in every human heart. The difficulties that they encountered at, at Mara and in the wilderness of sin and at Massa and at Meribah, as we saw at the beginning there of chapter 17. These were not caused by outward circumstances primarily, but by their own disbelief, their own discontentment, and disobedience. So God was teaching them to be, to be wary and careful of their own hearts. It is our own worst enemy, right? The Bible teaches that to us. Jeremiah 17 tells us that our heart is desperately wicked, right? It's deceitful above all things. The Bible says, who can know it? The world teaches us to trust our heart. It teaches us to follow our heart, right? We were talking to the teens this morning about lines that we hear all the time that, that we were reminded of, things that words that we hear all the time. And one of those uh, words that I was telling them was, let conscience be your guide. You remember that? Remember that saying? Who, who said that? Remember who said that? One of the kids said, wasn't it a little cricket? I said, yeah, that's close enough. Yeah, a little cricket said that, right? Let conscience be your guide. So the world for, for ages has been telling people that we are inherently good and we sometimes do wrong, right? 
Follow your heart. Your heart will take you towards what is good and what is right. And the Bible says to us the complete opposite. No, 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 no. The Bible tells us that our heart is desperately wicked and deceitful above all things who can know it. So the Bible tells us don't trust our heart. Why? Because it can be our own worst enemy. Even this week, I've struggled with things like that. Things that have, have ate at me because of the thoughts that I had that I know aren't true and aren't right. That God is always faithful. And that He'll provide a way through. And that God is loving and He cares about every one of our needs. That He's not distant, He's close. And He loves us. We need to take God's Word and allow it to inform our hearts and correct our hearts. Not follow Not follow our hearts because it is our own worst enemy. The Bible tells us not to trust our hearts. And we see even through the Israelites that it's for a good reason. And now they're brought into this situation that was out of their control, right? A situation that was not of their own devices. An external enemy that was beyond their control. And the enemy we see here, the enemy does not play fair. So go into Exodus chapter 17 and look at verse 8, starting at verse 8 with me down to the end of the chapter. The Bible says here, and then, and then Amalek, then came Amalek and fought with Israel in Rephidim. And Moses said unto Joshua, choose us out men and go out, fight with Amalek. Tomorrow I will stand up. For I will stand on top of the hill with the rod of God in my hand. And so Joshua did as Moses has said to him and fought with Amalek. And Moses, Aaron, and Hur went up to the top of the hill. And it came to pass when Moses held up his hand that Israel prevailed. And when he let down his hand, Amalek prevailed. But Moses' hands were heavy and they took a stone and put it under him and he sat thereon. And Aaron and Hur stayed up his hands, the one on the one side and the one on the other. And his hands were steady until the going down of the sun. And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And the Lord said unto Moses, write this for memorial in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. For I will utterly put out the remembrance of Amalek from under heaven. And Moses built an altar and called the name of it Jehovah Nasi. For he said, because the Lord has sworn that the Lord will have war with Amalek from generation to generation. Lord, we ask that you bless the reading of your word. Lord, I pray that you would allow your word to penetrate our hearts, even the hardest of hearts here tonight. I ask for your spirit to work and penetrate those hearts. Lord, that you'd speak to us and you'd convict us. Lord, that we would... Understand that we are to look to you and depend on you in the fight and the battles in our lives. Lord, I pray that you would get the glory tonight. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. So as I said, this enemy that that the people of Israel faced, they did not come to fight a fair fight. Go over to Deuteronomy chapter 25 and see how uh, Moses once again rehearsed this story of the children of Amalek who came and um, and fought against the people of Israel. Now you have to remember that um, um, the people of Israel had not been out of Egypt for for just a few months. That they had just been out of Egypt just a few months. That they were not a battle hard and uh, uh, ready army. That they didn't have. Uh, Uh, all the things that you think an army should have with chariots and all these things. The Bible does tell us that they had swords, uh, as we see there in uh, verse 13. But I want you to see here uh, tonight that this enemy that they faced did not fight fair. Look at Deuteronomy chapter 25 as Moses rehearsed it to them again in verse 17. He says, remember what Amalek did unto thee by the way when you were come forth out of Egypt, how he met thee by the way and smote the hindmost of thee even all that were feeble behind thee when thou wast faint and weary 
And he, Amalek, feared not God. And so we see the Amalekites came into the, 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 the um, people of Israel. And the Bible tells us here, as Moses wrote a little more detail about it, that they came in from the backside of where of the is of Israel's march of Israel's column and they attacked those that were weak and those that were feeble and the women and the children who were supposed to be back there in the back being protected they were the ones that got attacked and these these people these em, the, the children of Amalek they did not fight a fair fight we have to understand that even in our own lives that the devil's not going to fight a fair fight with us that he is going to attack the weakest parts of our lives the bible tells us that he he knows which lure to put out in each one of our lives the book of james tells us that that we are enticed by our own lusts aren't we and so we we get enticed very easily he finds our weakest points and our feet feeblest moments right those those times where we're at our weakest and our and maybe our our most down times and that's when the devil likes to strike and we see that as we live these our christian life as we've been set free of, uh, from the bondage of sin that god has given us this freedom and he fought that fight for us the fight that we could not fight and he set us free but now but now as children of the lord we're on our way to heaven and there's battles to be waged in our life. Some from within, some from without. And when those battles come that are from without, I want you to understand, those aren't going to be fair fights. Right? He's not going to attack us when we're at our best. He's not going to attack our strengths. He's going to attack our weaknesses, just as the children of Amalek did to Israel. And so they were attacked. So what was to be done? That's what we're going to look at tonight. What did the children of Israel do? Well, through Moses' leadership, we find, number one, that they were called to prepare to fight. Prepare to fight. So there is a preparation involved in to the fight. Now I want you to understand once again I've I've already mentioned it once that these the children of Israel had only come out of bondage just a few months previous to this. Okay? So so the these people that came along and attacked them weren't waiting for them to to get ready, right? All right, we're waiting. We're going to wait until the children of Israel are, are good and prepared, and we're going to write them a, a letter and say we're going to fight you. And most likely, because they were in this area called the Valley of, of Rephidim, this Rephidim, and this is where the children of Amalek, because they were uh, nomads, uh, they felt as though the children of Israel was, were stealing their water and were were taking uh, 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 their oasis and their 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 where their sheep and their cattle and all that stuff would come and rest and stuff and so they were upset and they were ready to fight but they didn't wait right they didn't wait until the the children of Israel had kind of gotten settled into who they were and understood their roles and all these things no they came and attacked them while they were weak but Moses called up Joshua and, at, and told him to choose people out to go and fight the Amalekites. And so, as we look at this, I want us to understand there should be a proactive response on our part to fight the enemy that is from without. Setting up boundaries for ourselves to help us in the fight that we fight uh, on a daily basis, the fight that we fight each week, the fight that we, the struggles and the battles that we go through, that we are prepared and ready for the fight, that we understand that this, that this life we're living, I can't remember who said it, but a preacher said that this life that we're living, this Christian life is not a playground, it is a battleground and we need to be prepared for the fight. And so Moses calls Joshua to choose out men to be ready to fight and they prepared and we too need to be prepared We need to prepare ourselves for the fight 
Spurgeon said this, the children of Israel were not under the power of Amalek. They were free men. And so we are not under the power of sin any longer. The yoke of sin has been broken by the grace of God from, from around our necks. And now we have to fight not as slaves against the master, but as free men against a foe. Moses never said to the children of Israel while they were in Egypt, go fight with Pharaoh. No, not at all. It is, the, it is God's work to bring us out of Egypt and make us his people. But when we are delivered from bondage, although it is God's work to help us, we must be active in our cause. Now that we are alive from the dead, we must wrestle with principalities and powers and spiritual wickedness if we are to overcome. Turn into your Bibles with me over to the book of Ephesians. As we listen to these words that Spurgeon penned, it reminds me of the words from the book of, of Ephesians. Go over to Ephesians chapter 6. This is what the Bible tells us to prepare for. To be prepared for the battles. To be prepared for the fights. It says here in Ephesians chapter 6 verse 10. Finally my brethren be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. How do we do that? Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to st stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not, listen to what it says here, against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having done all. To stand, stand therefore, having your loins girt about with truth and having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith wherewith you'll be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked and take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the spirit. You see here that we are too, just as the children of Israel were told to go and prepare for the fight and to choose out men to go and fight. We are to also be prepared in the fight that we are to put on the whole armor of God that we might be able to stand in the evil day and having done all to stand and that we would, we would be strong in the Lord because of the whole armor of God that we will be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. We depend on the power of God. That's our second, our second point. That we depend on the power of God. To be able to, to see us through these battles. But we have to be proactive in the fight. We have to be proactive in the fight. The Bible tells us to put on the whole armor of God. So that we can stand having done all to stand in that evil day. We, as we prepare for the fight, we can understand that we don't go at it on our own power. That's what, that's what Ephesians 6.10 6, says, that we are to go in the strength of the Lord and in the power of of his might that we depend upon the power of God. And so as they prepared for the fight, Moses told them that they would go down into the valley of Rephidim and that they would begin to fight with Amalek and that they he would go and stand up on a hill with the rod of God in his hand. And they looked to the rod and and, and they looked to the rod uh, for power. You see, this rod was a demonstration of and a picture of the power of God. Listen, God proved his power to Moses when he called him to go at the burning bush. You remember reading about that and learning about that a few months ago back in Exodus chapter four, where God called uh, uh, Moses out. And how did he prove his power to Moses? He told him to what? Cast down that rod onto the ground. It became a snake. He said, pick it back up. And it became a rod again. And Moses began to see a, just a glimpse of the power of God. It was proven to him. Moses showed God's power to the children of Israel when he stretched forth that rod toward the Red Sea. And we see the Red Sea 
parting there in Exodus chapter 14. We read up above uh, a few weeks ago here in Exodus chapter 17 uh, about how God show, uh, uh, Moses showed God's power to the children of Israel when he took that rod and he struck the rock and water came out of it. So you can understand why the children of Israel looked to that rod as Moses held it up in his hands and they saw the demonstration of the power of God through that rod. We also understand that Moses misused the power of God later on when he strikes a rock in anger. The word of God and prayer are how we tap into the power of God today. James 5.16 tells us to confess your faults one to another and pray for one another that you may be healed. Proving that there's power in prayer. But then he says these words, he adds this. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. That word availeth means that there is great power in that prayer. The effectual, fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Do you realize that, that there is power in prayer? Jesus taught us in Luke 18 a wonderful parable about the power of prayer and that how God moves through our prayers, that He hears our prayers. Isn't it wonderful to know that we're not praying to some idol, some stiff uh, idol with ears that can't hear and mouths that can't speak and eyes that can't see, that we don't have to pray to some idol, but that we can have access to the throne room of God through Jesus Christ? And that he hears our prayers. And there's power in those prayers. We know that there's power through the word of God. If Hebrews 4, 12 tells us for the word of God is quick and what? Powerful. Powerful. That word powerful there means to, to be living, lively, that, that is active. That is active in, in, in our lives. And it speaks to us. It says it's sharper than any two-edged sword. Piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit. And of the joints and marrow. And is a discerner of the thoughts and intents of the heart. See the word of God is powerful. Prayer is powerful. Do you believe there's power in prayer church? Amen. What happened in the valley Listen, what happened in the valley with Joshua and the men of Israel against the Amalekites, it depended on what Moses was doing up on that hillside. Our spiritual battles against the world and the flesh and the devil are won and lost through heavy artillery of prayer. This is what Riken says about this passage. He says, what happens... When we do not pray, it's very simple. We start losing the battle. Even when we have put on the full armor of God, we may be wearing the belt of truth and the breastplate of righteousness, the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, the sword of the spirit. However, if we do not ask God to save us, we will not be able to make our stand against the devil. Instead, we will be led away from truth into error. We'll be given into temptation. We'll be dragged down into doubt and discouragement. Church, we desperately, desperately need prayer. Prayer is where we find God's power. And when we see God moving, it is because of the prayers of the righteous. Effectual, fervent prayers of the righteous men availeth much. I bring this to our attention because we see Moses holding up his hands with the rod in his hands as a demonstration of power. You have to understand that the people of Israel for millennia have have prayed in this manner with their hands held up. I don't know when I don't know when it happened when people decided to fold their hands and and do this type of prayer but for millennia the people of Israel when they would go to the temple or when they would pray they would pray with their hands held high in prayer 
to God Almighty. And we see this demonstration by Moses as, as showing that we are dependent on God. We need God's help in our lives if we are able, if we're able to win the battles. We gotta have God's help. And this is not only true for individual Christians, but it's also true for the church. This leads to my third point from this story that dependence on others for continued strength and help in the fight is important as well. We aren't to just go at it alone. God has put us together on this journey. We see Aaron and her going up with Moses and as Moses' hands began to, began to get tired and he began to get weary that there, there we see Aaron and her coming to the aid of Moses and helping to hold his hands up high and giving him a place to sit as he tried to keep his hands up and the people fought as they saw them working together. We see the people and Joshua, these men that Joshua, that Joshua chose that to go out and fight. And they were part of that, that they were fighting together. It is this combination that can protect us spiritually and give us victory in the battles that we face. It is what God has for us to do. It is His will for us not to go at it alone as, as, as rogue Christians, but to go at it together and to find encouragement and help and strength from our brothers and sisters in Christ. We are therefore to pray together, to uphold God's word together. We're to pray for each other. We're to speak truth into each other's lives. Why is prayer so important? Why is this is so important is because God is the difference between victory and defeat. It is by prayer that we depend on him to win the battle. The power of prayer is not prayer itself, but the power of God. When we as a church come to the Lord in prayer, we're admitting in that moment of communication with almighty God that he is the source that he is our guide, that he is our comfort, that he has the victory. And we come to him in prayer, showing that we humbly submit to his will, that we humbly submit to his ways. We ask God to do a work in our lives and help us fight the battles and give us the victory. And we need him, church. We need God to fight the battles for us. And we need him desperately. And we find him. When we pray, whenever Christians were attacked in the early church, you go in the book of Acts and you'll see this true. Whenever they were attacked, the early church waged war with the weapon of prayer. One familiar story to me is when Peter was captured and put into prison. And what do we find the church doing? Gathering in homes and praying, Lord, release Peter from prison. And man, did God move in a mighty way in that moment, didn't he? Sent the angel, get him out of prison. And they were so astonished, weren't they not, church? Wow, we're right, we're right in the middle of the prayer service trying to ask the Lord to get you out. And here you are standing in front of us. They could not believe their eyes. That's how God works. We want to see our church grow. We want to see our church, want to see our church love one another and grow together. We need to pray over it. We want to see people come to know Christ as their savior as a result of our church family. We need to ask God to give us the victory. We see people in our family, our church family that are struggling, whether it be through marriage or finances or, 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 or whatever it might be, sickness and things like that. Lord, we need, we desperately need to go to the Lord in prayer. This is not just something we do to check off a box. We realize that there, there is power in prayer. And we pray to Him. And we should pray to Him as the New Testament teaches us. Always, unceasing. Lastly, we see that as they put their dependence upon God's power and God's strength, that they were able to win the day and that they defeated the Amalekites. 
The Bible tells us there in verse 13, And Joshua discomfited Amalek and his people with the edge of the sword. And it's interesting what Moses, what, what God has Moses to do, starting there in verse 14. That there to, he was to write it in a book and rehearse it in the ears of Joshua. So that Joshua would never forget who won that day. That it was God. Not Joshua. Not the mighty men of Israel. But it was God who won that day. And then Moses, we see him building an altar in verse 15. And he gives the altar a name. And that name is called Jehovah Nissi. Jehovah Nissi means the Lord is our banner. What is a banner? Most people probably don't use the term banner today. So they may be unfamiliar with even some of the younger folks in here today. But what is a banner? The banner is, a, is like a flag, what we would consider a, a, a country's flag is today. Or a military flag. Uh, it's also called a standard. And that standard is there. It's a standard that identifies. It tells you who these people are, right? It, 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 this flag, it goes into the uh, the battle's front line. Militaries of old looked to it for strength and for courage. And it brought them into formation and, and organization. And it gave them their bearings to understand where the front lines were and where the fight was supposed to be. And they knew where to be. And they knew who they were. Based on the banner. And so Moses has this altar constructed and given the name Jehovah Nissi to remind, to remind the children of Israel and to remind us today that it is God, it is God who should always get the glory for the victories in our lives. It should always be God that gets the glory for the victories within our church. It should be God who gets the glory in our lives. So when we give God glory, listen, we're identifying with him. We show him as our sovereign. We are identifying with him that he is God, that he is our father, that he, he is omnipotent and all things are in his hands. We look to him through, uh, through, the battle, through the battles of life by the word of God and by prayer to find our strength and our courage to move forward. It's through him that we be, that we come together as a group of believers and fight the good fight shoulder to shoulder. We know that he goes before us and we follow in full faith. And when we identify him as our banner, he gets the glory. And that really is the chief end of man to give God the glory in our lives, to give God the glory as a church family, that he gets the glory in the battles that we wage, in the wars that we face, that God is our banner. Aren't you glad that God goes before us, that he's there to fight the battles, that he wages the war and we depend on him, and we trust him and we see him do great things. He gets the victory. So thankful. We get to glorify the Lord with our lives because we've been set free from the bondage of sin. He's called us to the fight as we journey home. He's called us to stand up and fight for him and allow him to win wars as we're proactive in the fight. As we put on the whole armor of God, as we look to him for our power and our strength, to all, to all glory be to, to God. He's done great things in our lives. Lord, we love you and we thank you for your word. I just ask again that you would move in our midst. That you be glorified through your word. Lord, I pray that we wouldn't take prayer for granted. Lord, that we would come at it with a renewed spirit. Or that we understand that there truly is power in prayer. Lord, that we would understand 
that the effectual fervent prayers of righteous men avail much. Lord, I pray that you would convict our hearts or maybe some of us are so passive in our Christian lives that we're not proactive in the battles that we face, that we don't have our guard up, that we are not being watchful for our adversary. God, I pray you convict us to stand and fight. Some of us, Lord, need to fight for our marriages tonight. We need to get victory, spiritual victory in our marriages. Some of us tonight need to get spirit, spiritual victories in our finances, in our health, or in our family struggles. So, Lord, I pray that we would stand and fight and do everything we can through your power and your strength alone. And may you get the glory. Lord, we ask for you to bless this time of invitation in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you, church. You may stand to your feet with your head bowed and your eyes closed. Maybe you need, maybe you need to be saved. Maybe you know Jesus Christ is your Savior. I don't know what your spiritual condition is, but I do want to invite you to come and know Christ tonight. That He can wage those battles that are weighing you down. Those places where you felt defeated because of your sin. Man, you can give those over to Jesus. He can take those from you. God can forgive you of your sins and help you in the struggle. Maybe that's you here tonight. Why don't you come down? Meet me down here in the front. If you need to be saved, I want to invite you to come forward. Christian, if you're like me, the war wages on. Never stops. Not until we get home to heaven. It'll never stop. Are you proactive? Are you in the fight? Do you believe there's power in prayer? Allow the Lord to speak to you tonight. Father, we recognize tonight it is not by power nor by might, but it is by your spirit. And so I pray in our lives that we would recognize that the fight really doesn't belong to us. The battle belongs to our God, and we would simply just release that and give that to you, recognizing that you will bring the victory. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you. you may be seated. Just for a moment, got a couple words of announcement. Pastor David, thank you for that message. Really do appreciate that. And uh, a couple things I wrote down tonight as he was preaching was, when I feel like raising a fist in life, I need to lift my hands. Because the battle was not won by raising a fist. It was won by Moses lifting his hands to God. And that lifting of hands shows God, I got nothing of me, but it's all of you. And I also wrote down that Victory actually didn't come from Joshua because every time Moses' arms would fall down, what would happen? They'd begin to lose. It came by lifting our hands to our great God. What a great truth. So thankful for that. So with that said, this is my unashamed commercial, okay? 
we have prayer every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. And uh, we have a prayer gathering, and we, it was a different format this last week. And, boy, I don't know about you, but I thought it was tremendous. I loved it, and we gathered together, and we prayed for an hour. And um, it was a wonderful time. So I want to invite you uh, next Wednesday, well, this Wednesday night, I guess, and next Wednesday night as well. Um, but this Wednesday night, 7 p.m., we meet over in the fellowship hall now for that. And, uh, boy, it's just a great time. So I want to invite you for that. A couple other upcoming events for you, January 12th. In the morning, that's Thursday, and at 11.30, we have a Forever Young a meeting there in the Fellowship Hall, and Lori Reith is making food, so it's going to be good. So I'd love to have you come out for that. And then that night, there is a wedding shower for Ashley Richter and Josiah Green. That's in the Oak Room at 6.30 p.m., and all adults are welcome. It's not just simply a lady thing. It's it's everybody there, and so I invite you to come to that. And I love they're registered like, a, I don't know, tying the knot or something like that or Target, but REI is part of their registry. I love that. Isn't that so great? So if you're going to buy them something, I say get them something from REI. That's going to be great for them. And then um, All Church Outreach Saturday, January 14th, and then January 29th is our annual business meeting at 6 p.m. Now you'll notice um, that's a Sunday night, and we want to do it on a Sunday night just because more people are going to be there, and so that's why we are doing it on a Sunday night, um, last Sunday night of January on January 29th. Good. I think that's all the announcements I'm supposed to cover, right? I'm not usually... A good announcement, guys, because I miss stuff usually. But I think that's it. If not, check the app, check the website. It'll be there, okay? Let's go ahead and stand together, and we'll be dismissed in a word of prayer. And we want our Sundays to touch our Mondays. Remember that we have a banner, and he is Jehovah Nissi, the God, our banner. And remember that we can be comforted even in our affliction. Lord, as we go, uh, we are ready for the week because we go with you. And, Lord, I just pray that you would help us to stand for you, I pray that you would help us um, in opportunities to share your gospel with others, that people might be saved this week through the ministries of Bible Baptist Church. Oh, Lord, I pray that uh, you would be with every member of our church. They're going to face some difficult things this week. Thankfully, you're there for them. Lord, they're going to face some things that are going to stretch them and challenge them, and they're going to have to fight against some sinful responses. And Lord, I pray that they would yield to your spirit in those moments. But as we go this week, most of all, we want to glorify your name. So we need the enabling of your spirit to do that. And so we humbly ask for that, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. God bless you.